So last time we talked about how RSA can be used to encrypt messages back and forth. We haven't proven exactly why that works. We're going to do that soon, but I just want to review some of the basic algorithms in number theory, modular arithmetic that we learned in the last lecture. Uh, we talked about computing the greatest common divisor of two integers x and y. This is really a very simple algorithm. Um, it simply checks if one of the integers is zero, and then if it isn't, it takes x mod y. This percent symbol is just mod in Python. It takes x mod y and does the GCD of y and x mod y. And we discussed why this algorithm works and why we can be sure that it computes the GCD of x and y quickly. We also talked about this algorithm, which was extended Euclid's. This also computes the GCD of x and y, but it gives you a little bit extra. What it, what it does is it finds integers a and b, such that the GCD actually equals ax plus by. We didn't go into all the details for why this algorithm works, but if you want to see a proof of this, you can check the book. There's a nice little short proof for why this algorithm returns not only the GCD, but also returns integers a and b, such that you get this nice integer combination to describe d. This is useful for computing the modular inverse, which we'll get to in a moment. We also learned about how to do modular exponentiation, where we have to take x to the y mod n, right? And there's another very simple algorithm for computing this. If first you check if one of the inputs is zero, other then you just return one, right? Because x to the zero is always going to be one. Um, then you compute um, x mod x of uh, x comma y over two. This is the floor of y over two, uh, and n, right? You compute this value z. Um, if y is even, you simply return z squared mod n. Um, and if uh, y is odd, well, you lost a factor of x. So you have to just multiply this factor of x over here um, times z squared mod n, right? It's very simple. This is a very fast algorithm. And I think we argued that this takes on the order of n cubed uh, to compute x and y, where uh, this is n is the number of bits of x and y. Finally, computing the multiplicative inverse essentially just calls back to uh, uh, the GCD plus or extended Euclid algorithm. Once you can compute integers a, b such that ax plus bn equals one, well then basically a mod n is going to be your multiplicative inverse of uh, the number x. So we basically already solved this problem. The word of the day is, Boone, say it. Boone, come on, say it. Say it. Say it. Oh, God. Okay, the word of the day is mouse. Mouse. Oh, stop it. Stop it. So now we're going to prove something which is a little bit technical, but it's incredibly useful, and it's very relevant for this RSA cryptography. What we want to do is take a number n and consider all of the numbers x, which are between 1 and n, which are relatively prime to n. So what does relatively prime mean? It means that the greatest common divisor of x and n is 1. That just means that x and n don't have any factors in common. OK, so let's consider this set. We'll call it r sub n. r n will be the set of all integers from 1 up to n minus 1, for which the GCD of x and n is equal to 1. There's no common factors. OK, so let's call phi of n the size of r n. That just means it's the number of integers from 1 to n minus 1 that are relatively prime to n. OK, let's consider that set. Here's a simple example. If n is equal to 3, then r sub n equals just the set 1 comma 2, right? And therefore, phi of n just equals 2. OK, so what about n equals 15? Well, r sub n would then equal, OK, 1 is relatively prime to 15, so is 2. 3 is not, because 15 is 3 times 5. 4 is relatively prime to 15. 5 is not relatively prime to 15, because it's 3 times 5. Um, 6 isn't either, because um, they both have a factor of 3. 7 is relatively prime to 15. Uh, 8 is relatively prime. 9 is not, because of the factor of 3. 10 isn't, because of the factor of 5. Uh, 11 is relatively prime to 15. 12 is not, because of 3. 13 is relatively prime to 15. Um, and 14 is relatively prime to 15. So um, how do we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8? So phi of n equals 8. OK, I want to consider an important special case here. 
Let's look at the case when we have two primes p and q, and n is equal to p times q. So what is now r sub n and phi of n, right? I want to get the set of all numbers that are relatively prime to p times q. How do I get that? Um, so, so first, take um, r equal to, just, just take all of them, all the numbers, 1, 2, up to um, um, uh, n equals p times q. Okay, now I'm going to remove some of them. Two, remove, I have to remove all the multiples of p. Remove p, 2p, 3p, all the way up to q times p, right? I also have to remove all the multiples of q. q, 2q, all the way up to qp. So I first started out with r equaling all the numbers from 1 up to p times q, but then I had to delete the multiples of p and the multiples of q. I deleted p multiples of q and q multiples of p, but then I double counted p times q. You'll notice that I removed these guys twice here, right? And so I don't want to double count that. So in the end, I have p times q, which is what I started with. I subtracted off p copies of q, and then I had to subtract off q copies of p, but I add, had to add back in 1, so I have to add 1 back in because I overcounted the things I deleted. In the end, if you work that out, that ends up equaling p minus 1 times q minus 1. So when n is p times q, where p and q are primes, phi of p times q is just p minus 1 times q minus 1. Cool. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention one easy case. when n is prime, then phi of n is pretty easy to compute. Phi of n just equals n minus 1, right? Because all of the numbers from 1 to n minus 1 are relatively prime to n when n is a prime number. That's a very simple case. So this brings us to the key result that I want to get to in this segment of the lecture, which is known as Euler's theorem. And then there's a simple corollary called Fermat's little theorem. This is really a beautiful theorem. It may not seem like it in, uh, at first glance, but it is the fundamental theorem that makes all of cryptography on the internet work. The basic statement of the theorem is that if you take any integer x which is uh, relatively prime to n, so you first have n, you take x which is relatively prime to n. Uh, if you take x to the phi of n, you always get something which is congruent to 1 mod n. Um, and there's a the special case of this is called Fermat's little theorem. And Fermat's little theorem says that if you take any prime p and any integer uh, x from 1 to p minus 1, and you take x to the p minus 1, that's always congruent to 1 modulo p. And it's easy to check why Fermat's little theorem is just a special case of Euler's theorem. Let's try to prove Euler's theorem. It's a little tricky and maybe one of the most technical things we'll do in this segment of the course. Um, but it's very nice, and honestly, this is one of these results that got me into mathematics in the first place when I was maybe 19 or 20 years old. So I hope you think it's as cool as I did. Okay, so I want to prove something to you mathematically, but first I actually want to show you that it's true just using some code. It's a very simple fact, but it's a little bit surprising that it's true. So here I'm going to use the number n is 15. We already went through this case previously. Um, Rn, which is all of the numbers that are relatively prime uh, to n, Right, I'm just going to make a list of these things. Don't worry if you don't know Python. This is just taking the list and discarding the ones that, where uh, the GCD of num and n are, uh, is not 1. And then I'm going to print it out. Right? So these are the numbers that are relatively prime mod n. And there you have it. Those are the, the eight numbers that we came up with before. Now here's the thing I'm interested in. What about um, uh, if I take um, a equals, I don't know, some one of these numbers that's relatively prime to n. Let's say a is 2. Um, and now let's consider um, uh, taking a times rn. So I'm going to take all the numbers in rn and multiple, multiply them by a. So this is going to be um, uh, num a times num for num in rn, right? So I'm just going to take all of these things. Oh, I want to take this modulo n. So I have to do percent n, right? So um, I'm simply considering all of the, the numbers rn and multiplying all those numbers by this number a, which in this case is just 2, and then I'm going to print out a r n, right? Let's see what happens. Okay, notice that this list of numbers we get here, it's, uh, it doesn't look identical to this list, but actually it is the same set of numbers. You'll notice that I got the exact same set of numbers, just in a different order. It's a little bit surprising, right? I didn't get any new numbers, I didn't get the number 
um, 5 or 3, which aren't in this list, but I got all the other numbers that are relatively prime. Let's try this with another number. Let's not go with 2. Let's go with 4, let's say. Right? And again, I got the same list of numbers, just in a different order. So I took all of the numbers that are relatively prime to n, I multiplied them by some number a, which is also relatively prime to n, and I got, well, the same set of numbers, just in a different order. I permuted the set of numbers. This is going to hold true for all of these, uh, all of these quantities. Let's take 11, right? If I multiply everything by 11, again, I get the same list of numbers, just in a different order. That's an interesting fact, and we're going to show why that's true. So now I want to prove to you mathematically the thing I just showed you in Python in the previous bit. If you take any n bigger than 0, and then any element a in Rn, that's the numbers that are relatively prime to n, and now consider this other set, which is uh, you take Rn and you multiply every element in Rn by a, so it's going to be a times x mod n uh, for every x in Rn. Take that set, I'm going to call that Arn. This set ARN, it turns out, is identically just RN. You haven't changed RN at all. You've just moved the numbers around, um, but you've gotten the exact same set because sets don't care about the order. So let's prove this fact. This is actually a cute and nice little fact. Let's prove it. So let's just imagine A and X are elements of RN. That means that they're relatively prime to N. So we can just say that the greatest common divisor of A and N is 1, and the greatest common divisor of X and N is also 1. But uh, if they're both relatively prime to n, then the product of a and x is also relatively prime to n. And uh, we can conclude further that um, if we take the product of a and x, take that mod n, that's also relatively prime to n. You can think about why this is true. It's not too hard to check this. But all you're doing by taking ax mod n is subtracting some copies of n. That doesn't affect whether you, the number is relatively prime or not. If you're relatively prime, um, if ax is relatively prime to n, then ax minus n is relatively prime to n, ax minus 2n is relatively prime to n, and so on. So this is true. From here, we can conclude that if we take a times x mod n, that's also an element of rn. Why? Because it's between 0 and n minus 1, and also it's relatively prime to n. Therefore, it's an element of rn. Okay, good. That's step one. So here's another important fact we're going to need. Take three numbers from Rn, a, x, and y, and assume that x is not equal to y. Then it certainly is the case that ax is not congruent to ay mod n. So why is that true? Well, here's a little proof, and this proof relies very heavily on the fact that we can take a inverse. So the fact that a is relatively prime to n, so GCD of a and n is 1, that means that we can compute a multiple inverse of a, we'll call that a inverse, and then we can multiply both sides of the equation by a inverse. So if it were the case that ax were congruent to ay modulo n, then I can multiply both sides by a inverse and get a inverse times ax is congruent to a inverse times ay mod n. But of course, I can just cancel these terms a inverse times a, a inverse times a, right? Because that's just one. And I end up getting that x is congruent to y mod n. That can't be the case since we decided that x is not equal to y. Therefore, we can conclude, using this proof by contradiction, that ax is not congruent to ay mod n. OK, so if you think about what we just proved in 1 and 2, we showed that multiplying by a, some a in rn, take an x, multiply it by a in rn, it stays in rn after you multiply it by a. Similarly, if you take two distinct elements, x and y in rn, multiply them both by a, they're still distinct. What that means is multiplication by a just permutes the elements of rn, but it doesn't introduce any new elements or it doesn't send two elements to the same element. That means that multiplication by a is just a permutation, and therefore a rn is just rn. You haven't changed the set at all. Um, and that's a very useful fact, and we'll see why that is. So now we're getting to what I think is the most beautiful part of this proof, which is you have to consider a very interesting number. Let's take all of the elements in Rn, right? These are all the numbers that are relatively prime to n from 1 to n. And let's just multiply them together. We're multiplying all these numbers together. We're going to get k. Let's think about k. So using the fact that I got from the previous segment of this proof, we know that Rn is the same thing as a times Rn, right? I call this thing Arn, which is just you're just permuting the elements of Rn around. But Rn and Arn are the same. OK, so um, I can write this product as just the product of uh, all of the numbers in ARN, because ARN is the same. 
Um, but now let's consider an interesting fact about this. So here I'm just writing it a different way. I'm taking every x and a r n, but I could also just say take every x and r n, multiply it by a, and take that mod n. I'm just writing this in a different way. Cool. Okay, now what I've done is I've um, taken the mod n out to the outside and just written this as congruent to something mod n. Right? I can either do the mod n in the product or do the mod n in the outside. It doesn't really matter. Um, also, I factored out every copy of a. How many copies of a are there? Well, there's one for every element of rn, so I can factor out size of rn many copies of a. You'll notice that because we got the product of all of the x's for every x in rn, we can factor that out as k. We define k to be that product initially. Um, and we have this factor of a to the phi of n. So this is pretty cool. You'll notice that we have k on the left-hand side, k on the right-hand side, but we also have this quantity a to the phi of n. Interestingly enough, we can actually invert k and remove it from this expression. So to finish this proof, you'll notice that the product of all of the x's for every x in rn, that has, uh, that the GCD of k and n is going to be 1. If you take the product of a number of numbers that are all relatively prime to n, that product is also relatively prime to n. Therefore, we can take the inverse of k modulo n. So just take k inverse mod n, multiply that on both sides of this expression right here, and you'll end up getting that 1 is congruent to a to the phi of n mod n. And then the proof is done. So I know this has been a relatively technical lecture so far. There are lots of details and proofs to understand why some of these results are true. But I just want to make sure that even if you didn't understand everything, you'd get the five key takeaways that we need for developing RSA encryption. There's basically only five facts from number theory, modular arithmetic that we need, to, we need to have here to do RSA. The first, just keep in mind that R sub n is the set of all numbers from 1 to n that are relatively prime to n. Phi of n is just the size of that set. It's the number of uh, x's that are relatively prime to n between 1 and n. We need to understand what phi is for a couple of cases. When p and q are prime, phi of p is equal to p minus 1, right? The number of uh, integers that are relatively prime to p that from 1 to p is p minus 1. When uh, you take p times q, phi of p times q is p minus 1 times q minus 1. Euler's theorem is perhaps the most important and the hardest thing we learned. Um, for any uh, x that's relatively prime to n, if you take x to the phi of n modulo n, that's just 1. You're going to get 1 if you take x to the phi of n. For Mo's little theorem, which is just a special case of that, um, if you have a prime p um, and x is not divisible by p, then x to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Okay, so now let's move to actually how RSA works and why we can use these facts to help develop an encryption system.